All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Mike the New Haven podcast. This is episode 126. If you haven't checked out the previous episode, 125, that was with retired customs agent Lorenzo Toledo. Lorenzo was a U.S. Marshal, ATF agent, worked in the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office for a while as an undercover and was also with customs and then later on customs uh, and border uh, protection when they merged with uh, Immigration and Naturalization Services in 2003. Guy did a lot of drug busts, busted dirty cops, uh, busted gun runners. He led a life. So uh, if you want to check out that episode, believe me, uh, you won't regret it. So this episode, you know, uh, this is a, a unique one for me, and I'm glad I'm going to do it. It's with somebody that is definitely an interesting figure in policing uh, and evoked a lot of strong emotions when I put the promo out there. But a lot of people have some good comments, too, you know, and remember him fondly. And well, why wouldn't you? He's a classic example of a New York rags to riches story. He joined the NYPD in 1982. He didn't grow up with much in the Bronx, as he'll talk about. And he worked his way up the ladder to become chief of department. That's a great story. He cut his teeth supervising precincts uh, and running narcotics units in Manhattan and the Bronx at a time when drugs were just driving the city into a tailspin. And that made him uh, a a good candidate to be chief of department, where oftentimes you got to supervise incidents and moments that are not so good, but you need a clear-headed leader to get you through them. And that's uh, retired NYPD Chief Terry Monaghan, who I should mention is uh, helping the public now with their, specifically New York City with the recovery from COVID as an advisor. And he joins us now in the Mike DeMaven podcast. Chief Monaghan, welcome. How are you? Mike, pleasure to be here with you. Uh, pleasure to have you. So like I said, Bronx kid. Uh, tell me what that was like. Uh, growing up in the Bronx. Loved the Bronx. Still back there all the time. Uh, went to St. Raymond's Grammar School, St. Raymond's High School. You know, hung out in Parkchester. That was my neighborhood. Uh, ball field. It was great as a kid to grow up and walk out there, literally 20, 30, 40 kids out there playing stickball in the ball field in the courts. Uh, It was a great way to grow up. Uh, And listen, I love the Bronx. Parkchester has changed a bit since I grew up, but uh, still, it's a great place. Uh, It's a great borough, and uh, I wouldn't have wanted to grow up anywhere else. So early on, I mean, a lot of guys that I've had on the show talk about how they came from neighborhoods where, you know, everybody was either a cop, was a fireman or worked for the Department of Sanitation. You know, it's just civil service neighborhoods and it's in their blood from an early age. Was that your case? Absolutely. I I come from a history of cops. My grandfather was a a Bronx cop and worked in the 4-1 precinct. My father, a Bronx cop, worked in the 4-3 precinct his whole career. My brother, uh, who was older than me, 10 years older, he came on. uh, He started in the 70s. He worked in the 5-2, 4-2 precincts. Uh, It was in my blood, everyone I knew. When I came on the job in 1982, all my friends, all the kids I grew up with from the neighborhood, we all joined the same time. So there were around 15 of us that came on the job the exact same time, uh, all led different careers. But this is all we ever talked about. The only thing I ever wanted to do. I know there were some other kids that grew up that went into the federal side. I know that's what my mother wanted me to do. I never wanted to go to the feds. I always knew the NYPD was the best. Retired NYPD Chief of Department Terrence Monaghan is our guest here at the Mike to New Haven podcast. We're certainly happy to have him here. You're a Fordham graduate. Uh, Fordham has produced uh, many elite alumni. If you're a Knicks fan, Mike Green, he's the announcer for the Knicks. He's a Fordham guy, as is Michael Kay. If you're a Yankee fan, Vince Scully, the legendary Dodgers announcer, uh, same thing. So, you know, usually guys and gals go there for broadcasting purposes. It has a great communications program uh, that has produced many uh, iconic names, some of which I just mentioned. Uh, but for you there, going to Fordham, Usually for cops, you, you hear a lot of them in New York coming from John Jay, but what was it about Fordham that brought you there? The fact it was in the Bronx? It was a Bronx school and, and growing up, uh, my father used to take me to Bronx Park every weekend. My mother would go shopping on Fordham Road. We would go into Bronx Park and I would stand on top of the hill and I'd be able to look over from the park and see that campus. And from that day, I'm talking when I was five years old, that's the school I wanted to go to. I wanted to be a part of Fordham University. I always talked about it. Uh, going through St. Raymond's helped prepare me to go to that school. And uh, as soon as I could, when I graduated, that's directly where I went. Uh, It was a great experience there. I did two and a half years full-time going to Fordham. And that's when I uh, came on the police department. So it was kind of tough trying to finish a Fordham uh, education part-time while riding patrol in the 41 precinct. But uh, that's what I did. And I'm so glad I got that degree because it really helped me in my career. When you came out of the academy, I always like to, to say this because, you know, my, my friend Jeff Overdeer, who check out my interview with him, folks, I was part of volume 15 of my miniseries profiling the NYPD's bomb squad. Jeff, of course, was a bomb tech for 15 years. 
you know, he came on in 90. He was a housing cop originally, and he was from Ohio, so he didn't understand the housing transit PD system. And he was like, well, you know, guys he went over to were crying because they weren't going to be NYPD. They were going to be housing. And he's like, well, what do you care? We're going to be cops for you. When they said, OK, city, as opposed to transit or housing, how relieved were you? Oh, absolutely. That, that's the only thing I wanted. I had no desire to go into transit or housing at that point. You know, you wanted to be a New York City cop. You wanted to ride that radio car. You wanted to handle those radio runs. You know, out of my group of friends, one kid went to transit. He hated it. He actually, he, he couldn't, he didn't stay on the job. The rest of us that went to the NYPD all did our full careers. He was the only one that uh, didn't, didn't want to finish it out. Uh, I, I wouldn't have wanted to do anything else. This was what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a New York City cop. I wanted to ride in that radio car and, you know, be able to move up and all the different opportunities at uh, the NYPD office. All the guys and gals that came on on the job in the 80s and, and, and early 90s, you know, when New York City was at its peak with low crime and, and a general sense of safety, you guys were, the, were really the, the group of people that helped clean the city up. You know, it was a lot of work that had to be done in the 80s because as soon as you guys came out of the academy, you got thrown right into it. I mean, there's crime everywhere. Guns are on the street. Gr drugs are on the street. You got the crack is whack era going on. And here you are working in the Bronx where if you I talked in my introduction of you about cutting your teeth. You know, so when you look back on those patrol years, one thing I always like to ask is what are some of the more hair raising calls you can recall and who would you credit with helping you learn the job? Listen, when I went into the 4 1, we were the first big class to come out. And I was sent directly into the 4 1 precinct. So we were, me and a couple of guys, the young kids that were working with the old timers from Fort Apache, the ones that were there when Fort Apache really was the worst of the worst. You went everywhere, there were guns. And some of the, just some of the crazy incidences. I'll never remember working with my partner, Billy Redden, and we get a call 7 30 in the morning. 7.30 in the morning, what are you doing? You got your cup of coffee, you got your bagel. Pass the salt call, we don't think anything of it. You walk into the hallway, there's a guy sitting in the hallway crying. You ask him, what's up, what's going on, what's going on? He can't answer us, so it's one of those, ah, come on, you fool. Walk into the apartment, and there is a woman laid out on the floor, her head is blown off. There is a little dog sitting on the floor, licking and eating her brains. Me and my partner are sitting there, and you know, now you're looking at this, not expecting this. You still have that cup of coffee in your hand. And there was another body behind us, which didn't even realize she gets up, her face is blown off, and just grabbed my partner on the back. He thought it was a zombie. I swear to God, it was just insane. It turns out she was a 15-year-old girl who had just broken up with her boyfriend who came to the apartment with a machine gun and started letting loose and didn't know how to stop it. So riddled the entire apartment with gunshots. Uh, you know, she lived the one, her whole jaw was blown off from here down. Uh, the mother obviously was dead, you know, and, and this was just typical. It's 7.30 in the morning, the sort of calls you'd be walking into. Guns and Hunts Point, you know, it was every day. You know, you, you grab someone else out there, you grab the gun, learn some great cops. Richie Bella and Greg Dozinski, two of the sharpest late tour guys I've ever known from the 70s. Uh, when I got there in the 80s, they were still pulling guns every night. And you learn from them how to stop a car, how to get someone out, how to be able to make that gun arrest safely so that you made that collar and you went home safe at the end of the day. So there were some tremendous cops in that command. And you know, as a young cop, you have to sit back and you really have to listen and learn. Absolutely. You know, I always talk about it when I get my fireman on too. you know, the senior man, you watch the senior man and either directly or indirectly or the senior woman too. you pick up stuff that's going to help you in the long run. You know, I got to say, because a lot of guys, when they get on and OK, I want to go to ESU. Nothing wrong with that. ESU is great. I want to go to street crime. But back when it was around, same thing, you know, you get a lot of do a lot of work. But I'm curious, you know, in the 80s, since there's so much work on a regular patrol, I imagine you didn't have any desire to go to those units because you had all that you could handle right there. I did. I did. I ended up going to narcotics. Mm -hmm. You know, I was able to get in and again, being uh, at that time when all details were kind of empty because we were the new wave of cops coming in uh, with three years on the job, I was able to get into the narcotics. I did anti-crime in the 
And then I moved into the narcotics unit. And I tell you, those were where I spent two years, just under two years there. Two of the best years I ever spent on the job. The amount of work that we were able to do, it was non-ending. There was so much, so much drugs out there, so many guns. Uh, the team that I was in, in 1986, we took 86 guns off the streets. No, we were 86 guns in 1986. Uh, Easy to remember. Yeah, uh, exactly. I remember the last one. It was actually an Israeli-made Uzi that we found during a search warrant, uh, and that made 86. So we, we were very proud. The six-man <laughs> team, uh, we accomplished a lot, but there was no end to it. There was just so much. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, when you're working in narcs, uh, or the narcotics unit, I should say, it's, I don't have to tell you, it's dangerous because the drug dealers are naturally thinking, okay, are the cops around A or B, this person that we're making the deal with, are they going to try to rip us off? You know, is this the day that we get into a shootout? Is this the day ESU kicks down our door? So they're already hopped up. Sometimes they do their own product, which exacerbates the situation. And nine times out of 10, they're armed. And I don't have to tell you, you remember what happened uh, to Chris Hoban and Michael Busick. You remember what happened to Sean Carrington. Good cops doing the right thing, but it went bad and they got killed. Louis Lopez back in 93. So, you know, in those situations, What's key to making sure that you keep the situation as calm as possible until the bus can be made? You got to work as a team. You know, when we were doing the search warrants, we were prepared. We knew what was going on when we went through that door. Uh, we had one of the best undercovers in the world, Joey Arroyo. And Joey would be in there. He would know what, what guns were in the apartment, who had <clears> the gun, <throat> if the guy was a little hopped up. Uh, and then when you went in, you made that entry. You had to be quick. You had to be able to get people's hands. I know that's one of the first things Louis Anamone always talks about. And that is the, that is 100% control the hands. Sometimes guys like to step back and, you know, all with the gun pointing, you give that guy a chance to make a move. Someone has got to go for his hands. You control his hands, he can't pull that gun out on you. And that was one of the first things I learned. Always control the hands. Know where his hands were know how to get control of his hands as quickly as possible. Have your partner cover you, someone has to move in quick and get physical. You have to get hands on with people to make sure they can't pull out. Animo was on this show a while ago and it's funny because he's 75, but you could tell if it was up to him, he'd be kicking down doors tomorrow if he could. <laughs> the, the love for policing that he still has, and he's been out of the job since 99, is still so evident with him. And uh, if you want to, for my listeners that are here for the first time or you know, or new to the channel, go back and watch that interview with Chief Animal was great. I love talking with him. So, you know, I, I asked this to previously one of the firemen I got on. Uh, you guys were working during the AIDS era in the 80s, and nobody really knew what this was. Now, thankfully, there's treatments for it. There's procedures in place that help keep the public safe and the cops and other first responders safe. But when it was first really hitting New York City hard, and you're dealing with narcotics and sometimes needles and things like that, what was the procedure in the early days to keep you guys safe? First thing you ask the guy, especially if you were doing uh, just a regular junkie bus, you got a needle on you. Give me that needle. I don't care about anything else. I get stuck with that needle. You're going to pay for it. Uh, it. It was very important that we didn't get stuck. And occasionally, you know, guys got stuck. I got stuck. You'd go to the hospital. You weren't sure what was going to happen at that point in time. Uh, it, it was something that we all worried about. But, you know, just like everything else in policing, there were always concerns. There was always something that you're, you're gonna worry about, but you go out there and you do your job and you do it the best you can. And there are consequences. You gotta try and keep yourself safe as you can. But uh, listen, there was a lot of fear back in those days. No, I, I don't blame you. Um, your ascent through the ranks, and we'll dive more into your time working in commands in Manhattan um, as well. You know, guys really, some guys at least take to studying really, really early on in the job and good on them because they make it through the ranks pretty quickly as a result. Some guys don't, and that's okay too, just as long as you do good work. But for you, you know, when did the studying start and when did the interest in wanting to go through the ranks start? As soon as you got on the job or later on? No, so again, I was a cop in the 4-1. I was having a great time, a lot of fun out on the streets. Uh, as soon as I came on, they said there was going to be a sergeant's test. Every once in a while, you get put in the car with one of the older guys I was going to study. So if you're sitting in the car with him, you opened up a book and you studied a little bit. I really didn't 
prepare much for the sergeant's test. Uh, I, I originally, when I took it, I failed the test. And I went to, I did narcotics and that was gonna be my career in narcotics. They ended up, uh, if you remember back in eighties, there was a whole bunch of lawsuits based on the sergeant's test. And they changed around 30 answers on the test. With those 30 answers that were changed, I made sergeant. I was on the very bottom of that list, but I made it. And uh, I went uh, right to the four six precinct as a sergeant. Uh, I get there, all I wanted to do was go back to narcotics. The only thing I wanted to do. And I was working, we had a great administrative lieutenant at the time. He did a fabulous uh, evaluation for me to go back to narcotics. The CEO gets transferred out, he retires, still <clears throat> at the time. New CEO comes in, he throws out the administrative lieutenant, brings in another guy who I won't mention. <laughs> That guy rips up all the new sergeant's evaluations. Gave me an evaluation that said, sergeant is not given any command disciplines. And that was it. I couldn't put in the narcotics like that. It was at that moment, they announced that there was gonna be a lieutenant's test coming up. I just wanted to outrank this guy. And that's when I started to study him. So I started studying uh, in the 4-6 and then uh, I got transferred to the 4-4 and I did uh, a lot of studying. That test came shortly after that period and uh, I did very well on that test. And then when I made Lieutenant, as soon as I made Lieutenant, they said they were gonna give a captain's test. So you got that far, you might as well keep going. There you go. Terry Monahan's our guest here on the Mike New Haven podcast. Uh, interesting chat so far and more interesting details to touch on uh, as we go along. 4-4 Precinct, I gotta stop because I'm a Yankee fan. And the Yankee Stadium, the Yankee Stadium I should say, is in the confines of the 4-4. So uh, did you guys, I know some guys work the detail uh, from people getting into games and whatnot, patting them down and whatnot. Uh, what was your interactions as far as uh, working the detail, if you did at all at Yankee Stadium and uh, protecting everybody going to and from the games? Well, first off, I'm a diehard Yankee fan. So Me just too. being at Yankee Stadium uh, was always uh, an honor. Yes, I worked, it, I worked it as a cop and obviously in the Bronx, I, I helped run the detail over at Yankee Stadium uh, to be able to be on the field when the Yankees win a World Series, I was able to do that. Seeing the fans come in and out of that state, that stadium, uh, it's great. And knowing how much we have to do to keep the people safe getting into that stadium. Some of the toughest blocks in the city surround Yankee Stadium. Gerard Avenue, Walton Avenue, Ogden Avenue, a lot of violence. It was always, uh, you had to stop a guy who said, oh, I'm gonna park my car way up on Ogden Avenue and walk down to the stadium. Nah, 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 let's, Pay a couple of bucks and put it in the garage because you may not make it back walking uh, walking to Ogden back in those days. 4-4, uh, again, some great, great cops there. I worked the snow team with <clears throat> tremendous, tremendous guys. Uh, a lot, again, they're still in the 80s. So the cheese lines were there. You would Absolutely. see people, you would see 40 to 50 people lined up outside of Jessup Avenue, 1400 Jessup, all to get heroin. And we have to use every single trick to try and get the dealer in, whether it was pulling up in the back of a gypsy cab, uh, sneaking into the building, everyone runs in and a couple of guys stay in to get the dealer in the hallway. But uh, the cops I work with there always had another idea, another thought, another way to make that arrest. And uh, that was life in the eighties, you know, and it still is. Cops are always figuring out how are we gonna get the bad guy? It's what police work's all about. There's a funny clip um, in 98 when Shane Spencer was going ballistic game one against Texas in the division series. He hits a home run out over the uh, old Monument Park out in left field and a cop catches it in left field. And I was so envious in that clip. I'm like, I would become a cop just for that detail alone. You know, I'm like, lucky you. Um, but that's that's uh, that's an excellent detail uh, to certainly have. And, you know, because not only is there the stadium, but as you said, there is the work around the stadium. Uh, to keep people safe because you got people like, listen, I take, when I want to go down to see a game, I'll take the Yankee Clipper here from where I'm at New Haven and I'll go down there and it's an easy walk. Well, why is it an easy walk? Because the cops are on it. They're on their game. They're doing their job and they're keeping people safe. I want to pivot back before we go into the nineties and Larry Davis, the night that happened uh, where he shoots it out with the six cops miraculously didn't kill them. And Larry met at his own violent end eventually in 2008 in prison when he was stabbed to death. Where were you that night? Did you respond to that shooting? No, I wasn't at that shooting. Uh, I was in narcotics at the time. 
Actually, it was one of my CIs that we gave to the homicide squad that eventually gave up Larry Davis that got caught. Uh, that was a tough time for all cops, especially uh, when he went to court and he wasn't charged with trying to murder the cops. So we had, I remember, a very large demonstration marching around the courthouse, uh, protesting the DA's office about uh, how they were dealing with Larry Davis. This was uh, a man who tried to kill cops and was only getting charged with a gun possession at that point, trying to use self-defense against a bunch of VSU and narcotics guys. I mean, one guys that went to go grab him. Uh, it's just the heroism of the cops that try to go in there and grab this dangerous individual. Uh, now we talk about it now, we talk about it then. Bad guys getting over on the system, getting out when they shouldn't get out. This was a murderer. Larry Davis was a murderer and he tried to murder cops. You know, he, he met the end that he should have in prison. So, you know, I, I have no regrets about him. Yeah, and not only that, even when he was caught, you know, uh, I mentioned him often, and I'm pretty sure you've heard the name. I, I, Donald Sadawi, who was a retired detective from the bomb squad, a good friend of mine. The guy, when he, he held the family has, hostage, he had a pipe bomb. The bomb squad actually had to go in to fuse a pipe bomb that he had there. So he wasn't going to go quietly. And like I said, you know, when you, when you live by the sword, you die by it. And that's what happened with him later on in his life, the 90s. Um, there is the Washington Heights riots in 92. There's the Crown Heights, Crown Heights riots as well. It's a difficult time. Ray Kelly came in in 92. Ray Kelly, for his first, people generally remember him for his second stint as commissioner, but his first stint was pretty productive too. Um, but he leaves in 94 and in comes Bratton. Um, and Bratton, who had a good reputation from Boston, had a great reputation. Of course, he was a transit boss. Jimmy O'Neill worked with him in transit, our friend. And he brings in broken windows. And that is the beginning of a great period to where the city from 94 through the end of the 90s into the new, new millennium is completely made over. So much work was done because it felt like, no pun intended, the handcuffs were taken off you guys to go out there and get at it. So for you, as somebody that was working in such dangerous places in Manhattan, in the Bronx, how, how quickly did you guys see the effect of broken windows? Oh, that was right away. You know, there, there was the basics uh, when, when Bratton came in, you know, Louis Anamone, uh, Jack Maples, you know, they talked about cops being cops, going out there and making arrests. You gotta remember, prior to them coming in, if you made a drug arrest as a patrol cop, you would look like you were doing something wrong. The city had taken the NAP commission from the 70s and just kept that mentality through the 80s and early 90s that, hey, you can't, uh, you can't do certain things. Patrol cops can't be trusted to do certain things. I was a, a captain in the 3 4 precinct prior to uh, Bratton coming in. And Jimmy Gilmore, detective, great guy, comes up with some tremendous information about an apartment on 159th Street. He goes, he gets a search warrant for it. We hit the door, we get three kilos of Coke, three guns, two bad guys, a bunch of money. I'm saying, what a great job. The next day I get a phone call from uh, the chief of patrol who tells me if I ever did a search warrant like that again, I'd be in Staten Island for the rest of my career. It's not patrol's job to do something like that. You know, when Animon came in, this is what he wanted. He wanted cops to be cops, to get information and to act upon that information. And that, that was a huge change literally within weeks of them coming in and setting the tone that we were able to go out there, do our job, that if you're doing the right thing, you don't have to worry. There was so much fear prior to this administration of getting in trouble for something. Now they let you do your job. If you were doing the right thing, they were gonna back you up. And that was uh, Bill Bratton, Louis Anamone, John Timoney, that whole crew, Jack Maples. You know, they held a lot of people uh, accountable at Comstat. Those were tough meetings. They were fun to sit at at times if you weren't the target of their ire. But uh, you saw a change over it. You saw commanding officers that really knew nothing about crime just thrown out of their spots. Well, they put people in there who knew how to deal with crime, knew how to get their cops to go out there and do the job. So it, it was 
something we needed. We desperately needed as a city. And I think that was a turning point, 100%. The day Bill Bratton walked in there and created that team. You know, I got to say this for all these Staten Island residents out there. We love you. We are not dissing your borough. Staten Island is great too, you know, so shout out to everybody that works in Staten Island. But we, my friend, are going to go back to 1994, an episode of Cops, You Make an Appearance. Here we go. Uh, let's take it back to the year of 94. Down Wadsworth Avenue, cameras on 190th Street itself. When we go in, it's going to be two unmarked uh, anti-crime cars followed by the unmarked van for emergency service. Uh, we're going to have unmarked... Rambo, come here. We're going to have plain clothes guys here. I want everyone to take a look at the plain clothes guys so you know they're not the person, even though some of them look like them. <laughs> they're gangsters. Sh- when emergency service makes an entry, guys who haven't been on this, they throw these percussion grenades, loud noise. So it is. A chance that it could blow out a window. So if you're covering the side alleys or any windows, make sure you back away from windows in case any glass falls out. The unmarked will go to wind up. Roll in. We'll radio the uh, marked cars to move in when we're on the block. Everyone ready? Let's go. Yeah, we'll see. There's a good chance these guys are going to be out talking by the time we get We got to watch them. Jump over. We're going out to a warrant. They the uh, precinct got a warrant because they got information that the drugs and guns being sold out of the location we're going to right now. Back at 186th Street. Sensco was up. This is it. you back uh for sure that was a clip from cops 1994 you know and there you are giving the briefing these are very important briefings you want to keep the men safe i love how you mentioned that hey these are playing close guys so you don't confuse them we've had tragedies like that unfortunately happen so besides what we saw there take me through what goes into a briefing where not only are you briefing your guys but you got an elite unit like emergency service there too yeah, so in this particular case, this all started off uh, grabbing someone, Tommy Barnett, grabbed the guy with a couple of vials of uh, crack, debriefed him, gave up that apartment that, that we were in hit. So we knew about the apartment. Uh, the CI gave us information that there were cameras. So they had a full camera system sitting in that apartment, watching every entry of the building, which is why we couldn't send emergency service in first, because if emergency service went in first, they would have been seen and they would have got out of the apartment. So we had to sneak our undercovers in first. So we went in, we sent the undercovers up. Uh, my car and others, we ran up first before emergency service, but they got to unload so much stuff. But we had to go through each and every step. And we also knew that there were two adjoining apartments, that the one apartment was a sale apartment and the apartment next to it was a stash apartment. So we were going to be very cognizant of both of them and making sure that uh, we had enough cops covering every one of the windows in case stuff came out of the apartment. So this is all the stuff we got to talk about in the briefing. Again, ESU was throwing these percussion grenades at this point in time. 
and it sounds like a bomb going off. And you want to make sure that the cops downstairs, they see this, they're not overreacting. Glass could blow out of a window and they see the glass blowing back, don't stand under it, so you're not getting cut by the glass. Every step of this, we had to go through. And then we they did these warrants on a regular basis back then. And this particular one, as soon as we get upstairs, they all start coming out of the apartment like we figured, but they saw Ian Shu getting out of the trucks. They set a, a pit bull right at us. The pit came right at me. It was July 3rd. The last thing I wanted to do is have a shoot a dog and have to do all the paperwork. But as it's coming at me, Johnny D'Alessandro and Chris McCormick on either side and said, sorry, boss. And, and they lit the dog up. Uh, we grabbed the guys that came out of the apartment. One of them tried to run into the second apartment at that time. When the issue comes up, we haven't hit the first door, but we told him we saw a guy go into the second. They hit the second door. Two kilos of coke come out the window with a couple of guns on the second door. We end up uh, getting 10 keys of coke and I think five bodies. All because we were allowed to do this work. This is the sort of work that just, you know, that was 1994. In 1992, I was getting threatened to be transferred to Staten Island for having the cops do this sort of work. It was cops talking to somebody, getting information, and having the ability to act upon it themselves. And the results were tremendous. That was uh, also ESU Truck 2, uh, which operates yeah. out of Harlem, uh, present on that job. I was looking for some familiar faces. I couldn't spot them, but that's probably because it was the night tour. I was looking for guys like, you know, uh, uh, Mike Curtin in there, but I couldn't see him. So it was probably more of a day tour thing. Um, but yeah, I'll never forget what John Lampkin from Truck One told me because I got a mini series spotlighting the ESU. And he was saying how it's amazing these undercovers come out. And here you are as an e cop, you're, all, you're in this tactical gear, you're ready to go in, you got all the protection you need. The undercover comes out and he's saying, Yeah, they just put a, pointed a gun to my head nonchalantly. Meanwhile, you got all that you need, you got all the protective gear, and you're still having second thoughts about yeah. going through that door. So it takes a special breed to go in there with none of that and do that kind of work. It's really, it's really the best and the finest uh, of the finest. And so, you know, I, I had to imagine, and I do want to ask about this when you ascend through the ranks, as you go up, the politics increases. And you, you just, you, you strike me as the kind of guy that didn't care about that. You just wanted to be a cop. You just wanted to do police work. But naturally, unfortunately, as sometimes, not with everybody, but in any job, not just policing, the bigger people get in positions, the bigger their ego gets and they're more difficult to deal with and they become a not so good version of themselves. So how did you try your best to block out the bureaucracy that came at the top as you ascended and do your job the best you could? You keep surrounding yourself with real people. Yeah, other cops, and always remember, and this is something I've always stayed with me that I would never ask a cop to do something I wouldn't do myself. I always felt I had to be personally out there. I wasn't gonna sit behind a desk and tell someone to do something without being out there myself doing it with them. If you let your ego get a hold of you and you think you're better, I'm no better than the cleaner in the precinct. You know, we're all got a job to do. We all take our pants off at night. You know, uh, don't ever, don't ever think you're better than somebody because you're not. Some of the greatest cops in the world, I had the honor of being able to work besides, watch them do it. I couldn't do half the stuff that they did, some of the investigations that they did. To think I would know better than them all, no. My job is to support them, make sure they have the ability to do that job to the best of their ability and try and block out the noise. And there's a lot of noise that comes from all over the place. You know, I'll take that heat from others. You know, that's my job to allow you to be able to do your job. As a boss, you know, as I covered before on this show and uh, retired NYPD Chief of Department, Terrence Monaghan is our guest here at the Mike Community Podcast. You know, you're not only looking out for your safety, you mentioned going up the door, going up the stairs, excuse me, and seeing that dog coming at you. It's the safety of the guys that are around you. And not even in a unit like narcotics, period. You're responsible for them. You want them to come home. And that's a burden that is very heavy for any fire captain, any police captain to be in charge of, of that. And when guys and gals get hurt, it weighs on you um, for sure. You know, so as a boss, you got to know when to tell them, yeah, go in there and do it, but also when to pull them back and tell them, even if they really want to go in there, it's kind of like a kid that really wants that piece of candy. No, eat your dinner first. So as, as a boss, how do you toe that line? 
tactically, again, it's working together. We don't need cowboys. We don't need one guy running in on his own. We've seen that in the past. That's how people can get hurt. Work with your partner. Work with your team. Listen, uh, in, in the NYPD especially, you get on that radio and there are going to be 20 to 30 cops running to your side to help you. Get the help. Don't think, don't be afraid to call for help. Think you have to do it yourself. This is what we do. Everyone is out here to work together. And that's just the, the, the concept. You, you can't, you're going to be in harm's way. Cops get in harm's way. And you can't be afraid to go into harm's way. It's what we do. You know, you're going to pull over a car and 90% of the time, it's going to be no problem. 10% or 1% of the time, that guy may have a gun and he may want to use it on you. You don't know when it's going to happen. But always be cognizant. Always be thinking. Always be determined to make sure that you and your partner are going to go home that night. Uh, you know, you, you can stress it, make sure they're wearing their vests, make sure, you know, and again, in the 80s, uh, I am as guilty as anybody of not wearing the vest. You just didn't wear it that often. A lot of times you should have had it, you, you didn't. I'm glad to see nowadays cops are wearing it on a regular basis. And, you know, I really don't see a cop anymore that goes out without a vest. So that's a good thing. But always got to be thinking tactically. And I, as a boss, uh, one of the things that I wanted to push out, and I, I love body cams now, because we can show situations to cops. This is what happened. What would you have done? Think tactically. Always think tactically as you're out there. Any job can go sideways in a heartbeat. This is what happened to these cops. I want you to see it and think, what would you have done in that situation so God forbid you are in that same situation. At least your mind is working the right way. As you say that the job, you recall this, I'm sure. Oh, it was a little while ago. Two cops are going out to a domestic violence job in Queens. You know what I'm talking about, probably. The woman's talking to them. It's normal. One second, she's saying, yeah, this happened. And, the se and then next thing you know, her, uh, her significant other, who was an armed security guard, walks in with the gun. And on a dime, the situation turns and a shootout erupts. And thankfully, they weren't killed. Sadly, unfortunately, they had to do what they had to do and the, the guard died. But, you know, you, when you're shooting at cops, you kind of you're asking for it, unfortunately. Um, and that's what ended up transpiring. But it's a great training video. And that, listen, always have your head on a swivel, not to the point where you're paranoid, because that doesn't help you either, but to the point where you can exercise the proper caution. And I, I want to pivot back for a second. Ninety five uh, transit goes into NYPD as this housing. So now a lot of the guys and gals are shifting laterally. If they were in housing homicide, now they're in uh, NYPD homicide. If they were in uh, transit, uh, plainclothes, anti-crime, same thing, NYPD anti-crime. So now you have more of a roster to work with. And that's a good and a bad thing. It's a bad thing because there's so many guys and gals now and you want to make sure you use them correctly. But it's a good thing because, well, there's so many guys and gals. So when you're absorbing this talent, you know, they, they may wear a different patch, but they took the same oath. They got the same dedication. How did you go about making sure that you made them feel welcome and also use their, use them to the best of their abilities? You know, we always dealt with them. It wasn't, though they were separate departments, we always saw them out on the streets. You know, in Washington Heights, you used to see the housing cops all the time, interacting with their captain all the time. It was just under a different chain of command. Now we got it under the one chain of command where we're all on the same team. Uh, I think it was a very easy, for us in the NYPD, it was just having more people, more, uh, more help to do things. I think it was a bigger challenge for the guys coming in from housing and transit, just learning that, hey, there's a lot more than just housing and transit. Because as a patrol cop, you went into transit all the time. As a patrol cop, you went into housing all the time but not really vice versa. So uh, I think it was a welcome transition for most of them. You know, you still hear some of the old housing guys talking about the hostile takeover <laughs> that took place, but uh, it, it, was, it was the appropriate thing to do. It was silly to have three separate departments running the city, uh, not working hand in hand with one another, not supporting one another. Like now when there's issues in transit, we put additional resources right in there and it's seamless. Uh, it's the way it should be. It took a little time, but I think uh, the adjustments really happened fairly quickly without, uh, without much of a, a bump in the road.
There's a great New York Times article from 1995 when the merger was announced that some housing cops were walking around with the morning band, not because of the, the line of duty death of an officer, but they asked one of them, you know, why are you wearing that? And Times reporter, we're mourning the death of housing. You know, <laughs> some of them didn't like it, but at the same time, I go back to my friend Jeff Overdeer, you know, who wanted to be in the bomb squad in the worst way. It helped him because now yeah. he's in the PD, he can advance and he gets to the bomb squad and he ends up spending the remaining 15 years of his career there. So I, I want to get to it and we'll speed through. We just hit 20 years since 9-11. Um, that day, you know, you, you knew a lot of the ESU cops. I'll show a clip in a second of you briefing one of them, not on 9-11, but before that, a lot of other great guys and gals too, you know, getting down there. I don't know if you got there before the collapse or after the collapse, but nonetheless, seeing the devastation and knowing that so many of your friends, I'm sure from the fire department too, were killed. Uh, that day, just take me through it. That's uh, again, obviously probably the worst day ever uh, in the history of the city in this country. Uh, I, I was up in the 3-4. I was supposed to have the day duty that day. And they changed me. The last minute, because there was a contentious election that was going to take place in the Heights. So they wanted me working later, later that night. So I was at home when the planes hit. And I was taking my kids down to the bus. And you hear it on the radio. A, a plane hits the, the tower, which I'm looking at, you know, still at the, your screen behind you. And it, it hits that tower. You're not thinking anything of it. You're thinking it's a, you know, a prop plane that hits it. You didn't realize exactly the devastation that was about to occur. I come home, and a little while later, this is the day of the pages, my pages starts going off. I call in, and that's when I really understood what was going on. Now you're racing down, you race down the, uh, the Palisades, and I was the only car on the road, you know, had the lights in the car, going across the GW Bridge, only car on the bridge watching the smoke coming from downtown. By the time I got in, the towers had already started to come down. First one, it just came down. They told me to stay up into the heights that they had what they needed down there. So I was up at the, for that day, I stayed up uh, in Washington Heights and, and our problem was to try and get people out of the city. Port Authority had shut the George Washington Bridge completely. I had to go over and meet with them to try and get it open so I can get people out of the city. They were afraid to open it. You know, they were, well, what if a plane hits the bridge? What, could the bridge withstand it? Uh, the lower deck, what if a truck bomb blows up underneath the bridge? Would it withstand it? And to this day, a uh, decision was made not to put trucks under the bridge. Still, no truck comes under the underneath the, of the GW bridge. Makes sense. It, it fought, you know, for hours trying to get people in. Now I had people piled up on the New York side, who walked up from downtown, trying to get across that bridge. We finally had to line up cops all the way across the GW just to cross people. We had to basically, we took control over the, over the bridge. Port Authority, he kept reaching down for, uh, you know, direction from downtown, little knowing that all his bosses had died in the collapse uh, of the towers. So he had no one to reach out to. We took over the bridge, we started to get people out, shutting down all of Manhattan that day. Every entrance into Manhattan, we shut down. No one could come into Manhattan if you didn't live, live in Manhattan. Cops, you know, we kept sending them down. You couldn't keep them from going down there. I went down there the next day uh, and the devastation and what you saw and just the, you know, the hopelessness, the silence down there. Uh, something that uh, you'll never forget. Um, friends that we lost that day and friends that we continue to lose. Uh, from 9-11 related cancers. And, and that's just uh, something each and every year we attend another memorial for more names that we have to put on that wall because they went down there, they did their jobs and they're still suffering from uh, the long-term effects of being down there in that toxic environment. You know, it's something we'll never get over. Uh, but, you know, as a city, we bounce back and it's the dedication and everything that our men and women did, whether it's firefighters, cops, iron workers, down in there that built this city back up and made it, uh, you know, got it back to where, where it was. 
You know, the NYPD really remained an integral agency because if you think about it, the fire department's top brass was decimated. You know, the first deputy commissioner, Fian, chief of department, Cansey, they were killed. Uh, a lot of their citywide chiefs were killed because the fire department, you know, they go right in. It doesn't matter if you're a high ranking chief or if you're a probie firefighter, you go right in, which is why they call it the Brotherhood. Uh, the Port Authority police, as you said, Chief Fred Marone, uh, Chief James Romito, they were killed. So, you know, the, the Port Authority police lost their uh, top brass as well, but the NYPDs remained intact. Nonetheless, I think the tactics were um, very, very helpful to the department because even though even 23 officers in one day is a mind boggling number, it could have been a lot more. I mean, we had 14 ESU cops and nine other, uh, eight patrol officers, one bomb squad detective, but it could have been significantly higher. But by you guys saying, or for the top brass, excuse me, for them, by them saying, hold off, Put, go to the bridges instead, safeguard this location instead. I mean, cops, they want to get down there. It's their instinct. Do you feel in hindsight that by them telling you stay in the heights, that it saved your life? Yes, probably. You know, you would have been down in that toxic environment that day. You, you don't know. You don't know. I mean, first bill had already come down, but, you know, the people who died of cancer since breathing that air from that very first day, but it's, it's typical of everything in what policing is. You have to hold your position. Not everyone can run to the middle of it. If there's a secondary attack, uh, it's on any job we do. Even if you go into a gun run, not everyone can run to the middle of where they're calling because that guy's going to leave. He's going to be somewhere else. We have to cover perimeters. It's what we do in policing. Everyone wants to be right in the middle, but uh, it's a guy that stays on the ends that may catch the bad guy. And it's just, we got an entire city of 8.6 million people we have to police. So we couldn't all run down and be in one spot at the same time. I remember, I don't know if you know, my friend Kevin Barry from the bomb squad, uh, he was the first responder down there and he was looking up at the intersection. He was telling me, even while we were down there and more personnel came in later uh, to help out, you know, we would still get dispatched out from the trade center to other bomb jobs around the city. Go do that, get down to the trade center, go do that, get back down to the trade center. So it's a good chain of command. You know, uh, a couple of three ESU cops that you knew particularly, I mentioned them often here on the show, Joe Vigiano, uh, Mike Curtin, and John Delera from Truck 2. Uh, Delera and uh, Curtin don't appear in this clip, but Vigiano does. You briefing them on a, on a drug raid in uh, March of 01. This is from the documentary honoring uh, both Joe Vigiano and his uh, firefighter brother, uh, John. So let's take you back to March of 01. Our tour starts at 1515, which is 315. And we'll get all our equipment ready. We'll load all our personal stuff onto the truck. Uh, this is an Ithaca 37 shotgun that we use. It's standard in all our vehicles. It's a little old, but it does the job, gets the job done. It's a, it's a rough gun to shoot. You figure the hands that have touched this weapon, you know. This guy's probably 70, 80 years old today that were, you know, slinging it around a few years back. I got in in April last year and uh, trained for six months and got out, was transferred to truck two in November. You're working with a team, it's a team of uh, eight guys, that's steady guys. There is a very unique tightness in a unit that deals with our type of work on a daily basis. We're put into situations where my life depends on the guy right next to me. The way we're gonna do it, Sean's gonna go in first. We're gonna set up on Amsterdam Avenue. He's gonna circle to the back. Once he's in the back covering the windows, he's gonna radio for us to move. My car will go in first, DSU, just stay on a, a slight delay behind it. We'll let you know when we're in front. At that point, you guys start to move in. We'll get our guys up to the roof and to ghost the doors. All right, the deal is uh, it's a straight work spot for cocaine. There are supposedly lookouts in front of the location with the radio. What happens is the guy will take the coke, he'll dump it in a bucket of water, he'll attempt to spill it, and he'll try to bail out the window. A CI was in the apartment, he observed a firearm. He said it was a revolver. The door is fortified with a four by four beam from the floor to the door. Guys, if something happens in the apartment, you does any gunfire, let us handle it. If anybody gets hurt, the hospital car will be looking for you guys to get us right out. Where do they usually dump the bucket? <laughs> right in the apartment. Right in the, Somewhere so, in there. Somewhere in there. Gotcha. Try not to knock the bucket over, because yeah. the VA says if they dump in the bucket and the water's there, they get charged with the weight. <laughs> there you go. That's a throwback. You know, and, you know, the SC Joe Vigiano in that clip, a uh, guy who was one of the more decorated cops in the city, uh, made it cool to be a detective in the SU because normally you weren't a detective.
in the SEC, but he, he made that cool by going there after he got chucked the second time, I believe. You know, when you're working these jobs and you call the SU and, you know, the guys you're normally seeing come out the truck, they're not there anymore because they lost their lives in this disaster. How long did it take you? You never get over it, as you said, but how long did it take you to, to realize, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to see these guys around anymore, sadly? Um, it's devastating. Uh, but as a city and as a job, we continue. You know, no matter what happens, someone else is there to do it. May not have been able to do it as good as Joe. I don't think anyone can, but uh, there's always other cops. You know, even if you retire, there's someone else that comes in, takes your spot. It hurt not to see that team there because we, we were very close with them. We did a lot of search warrants with them. Uh, Sean O'Connor was the second guy talking there. He was with me on quite a few different commands. Uh, we did a lot, a lot of good search warrants with some of these great, great cops. And uh, I will remember the hundreds of them we went through the door and I always knew things were gonna go well because they were so professional at what they do. But to this day, the issue still operates. They're still professional. They're still going through that door. And they're still putting the cuffs on those bad guys, grabbing the guns. A couple of sides. One, I see Danny Cohn and Bobby Yeager in that clip. I'm trying to get you guys on the show. Come on the show, please. And the other thing is, uh, you know, I got to say ESU's limerick. When a cop, when a civilian needs help, they call a cop. When a cop needs help, they call ESU. And the other motto of ESU, anytime, baby. So, uh, yeah, I, I love those two uh, limericks there that they have. So, and obviously police and change after 9-11. And uh, there's good that came out of it in that. Look at the Counterterrorism Bureau. That Counterterrorism Bureau is better than some counterterrorism bureaus that federal governments have in other countries. You know, and uh, that, I remember Ray Kelly doing an interview a few years back when he was still the commissioner, and he didn't go into detail. He can't, obviously, but what he could, did disclose, it just, it leaves your jaw on the floor. Wow. You know, the amount of resources and great work here and abroad, the Counterterrorism Bureau of the NYPD and Intelligence Bureau, too. Uh, does. So I'll accelerate ahead because you're a busy guy. I don't want to keep you long. Chief of department, being in that role, we talked earlier about being a boss on a, on a you know more local level and running a precinct or running a unit. Now you're running the entire department, you know, and you got to deal with everything. And when it hits the fan, they're looking at you. You know, it, when it's really a major emergency, you're there. There were a few of them. There was the truck attacks that uh, killed eight in 2017. There was the attempted pipe bombing, but thankfully, because this terrorist was an idiot, Thank God for that. <laughs> he didn't detonate the bomb properly. Nobody was hurt except for him. And nobody feels sorry for him. But nonetheless, in these major incidents, and even in just day-to-day -day operations, take me through the day of a chief of department. It starts bright and early. You know, I was uh, in my office before six o'clock every morning, uh, leaving my house. You know, I lived a little farther away, an hour's drive in. So up by four-ish every day. You're getting briefed on everything that happened the night before, every shooting, every incident, anything that may be ongoing. Uh, by nine o'clock, you're starting every meeting upstairs, whether it's a PC meeting, whatever is on your schedule. Uh, straight through the day, obviously on Wednesdays, you're preparing for ComStat. On Thursdays, you're doing ComStat. A lot of things go on your schedule, but then things happen. They just throw that schedule right out the window. You talked about the pipe bomb terrorists. I remember that was early in the morning. I was sitting in my office, getting ready to start some meetings. I get the call, me and Tommy Galati ran out there and, and we're standing literally at eight o'clock in the morning over a terrorist who just blew himself up. And the guy was as calm as can be. His insides were hanging out, but he was just calm as can be saying, I just, you know, I hate America and I wanted to kill people. You know, uh, you never know what that day is gonna bring. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, you schedule throughout. Usually there's some event you have to go to at night that uh, whether it's uh, a fraternal group uh, dinner, uh, some award ceremony for some cops. As chief of department, it's important to be there. It's important to go out there and show that you care uh, about your, your fraternals, that you care about your cops, you care about the cop that did something good, and you have to be at these events. I'd be exhausted going there eight, nine o'clock at night, but you had to be it. And you always had to have that smile on your face. Always had to be positive when you were out there. So the days were long and then you get home, you go to bed and you get that phone call at one o'clock in the morning because uh, a cop got involved in something. 
And I always felt if my cops got involved, if they ended up having to shoot somebody, I was going to make the drive in and I was going to be there to make sure that, uh, you know, things were handled correctly, that the media was handled correctly. Uh, and it became tiring. It's nice to sleep through the night now. Uh, <laughs> not get that phone call and get uh, eight hours as opposed to four. But it's also the most rewarding job in the world because you get to see and hear the things that these men and women do. They do amazing things. And you get to hear their story. You get to tell their stories. And you get to see what they've accomplished in the city because God knows where this city would be if it wasn't for the men and women of the NYPD. Absolutely. And I was going to ask you, but you kind of answered the question. I said, you know, even though I'm sure you missed the job, was there a part of you when Rodney Harrison took over that's just like, here, <laughs> take it, be my guest. <laughs> You know, there you go. But uh, I, I'll say, I guess, you know, that 2020, John Miller, who's a friend of mine who's been on the show, called it, called it the invisible bullet. We got COVID uh, hitting us hard um, in March. And I'll never forget, you know, I, I'm a big sports fan, as you could probably tell. I mentioned it earlier. Yankees, Rangers, who are on fire right now. The Knicks. There you were, go. I love the Rangers. Yeah, me too. Uh, the, uh, the Knicks are up and down. But, hey, I'll take it compared to the crap they used to put me through the past. And I'm a Giants fan. We're going to ignore them. But, you know, there I was watching SportsCenter and then Rudy Gobert, the center for the Utah Jazz, got it. And that's when everything really in America just began to just shut down. But the NYPD, the FDNY, nurses, EMS, they couldn't. So we had that. We had the unrest. When you look back at it, I mean, obviously, there's a certain portion of people that, as you saw when I posted on LinkedIn, I was having you on the show, still hold some strong feelings. Is there anything you would have done differently? And if not, well, then tell me why you why that is the case. Sure. Listen, it's first off, the worst year ever for the history of law enforcement. I mean, everything hit us at once. Going through COVID, uh, being forced as a police department to separate people, keep them away from one another, not allow people to gather. You know, that probably was a mistake for police departments to, to be doing that. And then it led into George Floyd and every all hell broke loose on us. And I was out at the, I was actually before the Barclay Center that Thursday. There was a demonstration down at uh, Union Square Park. It got violent. You know, they were throwing uh, barriers at us. Uh, we started making collars right off the bat. One of my sergeants ended up getting knocked out, Connor McDonald. Uh, we made around, I think, 60 or 70 arrests that night. We increased our details huge uh, for the next day. Probably could have been even bigger. Obviously, once, you know, you look at it in... Uh, in retrospect, at the Barclays Center, we never expected the crowds that gathered at the Barclays Center that night. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people there. And right around six o'clock, they started attacking us. I was standing up in the front of the Barclays Center. Everything they could throw at us, at a row of around 15 cops, was getting thrown at us. And we were doing everything to hold the line, to hold the barriers. Called in for the reinforcements, called for the SRG, which had been engaged in Manhattan, come over to, uh, to Brooklyn. Finally, when we got them in, we were able to start making arrests, start clearing it out. The cops and everyone that was there stood that line, held up when we were outnumbered, and we were able to clear it up. It took till 11 something that night to clear it up, and hundreds upon hundreds of arrests made. Leading into the next couple of days, uh, we had a cop surrounded in Brooklyn in his car, commanding officer, the 71 precinct. His radio transmission was, this may be the last radio transmission I ever make. Get him out of the car. We're over there trying to break it up. Arrests were made. He gets out safely, he get hurt. I think he's out three quarters now based on those injuries. We, we continued looking for elected officials to help us on that scene, to defuse it. Jamani Williams was there trying to talk to that crowd that night. Wouldn't listen to a word he said. Pushed him out of the way to run up the block and try and destroy a couple of our cars. We had to go out. We made more arrests there. That night on Bedford Avenue, I was out there with, with the Brooklyn South, some of the bravest cops and commanders I've ever been with. The street was out of a scene of apocalypse. City buses abandoned on the streets, fires, an RMP burnt. We're out there getting cinder blocks thrown at us for hours upon hours upon end. I was calling 
operations to get additional personnel. There were none. We had to wait around two hours before we were able to get a couple of teams out there, fireworks being shot at us, cops getting hurt, getting cleaned up and coming right back to the front line again. Eventually, once we got the reserve there, we were able to move in and make a bunch of arrests over there. And that leads into uh, to the Monday demonstration. Monday, 10,000 people or so marched down into Washington Square Park. For the most part, that march down there was uneventful. We had a group that broke off around 23rd Street. That group got a little violent with us. I was there. We made a bunch of arrests. Uh, around 20 or so from that group. The rest of the 10,000 had marched down into, into Washington Square. An incident takes place in the park. Tommy Galati sees a, a fight going on and sees a guy going into his bag, going back into a knapsack, believes the guy's about to get a gun. He's in plain clothes uh, with one of his lieutenants. They go in, they grab the guy. As they grab him, the crowd surrounds him. One team of cops, 20 cops, come in there and form a line to get Tommy Galati out of there with the, uh, with the arrest. At that point now, the 20 cops are surrounded with people yelling at them in the park. So they're lined up, but we're not protecting anything in the park at that point. We're able to get the cops out. I get them out back onto the street. We're on a little side street there. And there is a, the march is now continuing down. I believe that's 2nd Avenue over there. I'm not 100% sure. On the side street, though, all of our department cars are parked. So we can't give up this side street. I have 20 cops at this point. And now every national media station is standing there. Of course, they've seen the incident that was taking place in the park. They are now standing on this little side street. One of the stations actually starts interviewing me about what was going on in the park. As that happens, bottles start coming from the crowd, actually hits, hits me and hits the news guy. At which point, obviously, I push him aside. Now we're standing in the line. People are advancing at our cops. We can't give the street up. I have 20 cops. I got 5,000 people on the street. Bottles are still coming from the middle of the crowd at us. It was at that point for the first time in three days of, of this that someone came out from the crowd, one of the leaders of this march, that tried to defuse the situation. He came out with a speaker, microphone, and started talking to the crowd, telling them this is not about the cops. This isn't what we're about. We're not, you should, these cops didn't do anything. He was defending my cops on the scene, telling people to back out, back out. He's covered in sweat at this point in time. Turns to me for help. Chief, please help me, help me. At which point I go and I take the mic and I tell him to start, that as a crowd of 5,000, they have to get rid of the anarchists that are in this crowd that are trying to turn everything into a fight with the cops that the anarchists, these people from out of town who were coming in, and these were the ones that were causing 90% of the trouble that we were having, they had to be removed. If the mob, if the crowds that were out there protesting were able to remove them, then the protest could be peaceful. It was at that point, the crowd calmed down, and that individual who came out, that leader from that crowd, that came out and put himself in harm's way, put himself between the cops and the crowd, he asked me, kneel in solidarity with me. I said, I'll kneel with you. And that's what I did. And at that point, the crowd cheered and walked off and my cops safely, safely were able to go back. No cop got hurt. There wasn't a fight on national television that could have made, uh, made the NYPD look bad. And this was something, when someone's willing to work with us, it's what we do. We do what we need to do to defuse the situation. People, if you read the comments, they were sitting at home. They weren't out there. I was out there every minute of the day. And you can ask the cops that are out there by my side every minute of the day. That was the right thing to do at that moment of time. And I do it again. You know, had it not been for that year, and everything that came with it, 
are you still the chief of department or were you going to leave anyway? The mayor made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So uh, with everything that was going on, he made me an offer. Uh, financially, it was a good offer for me. Um, I was looking to leave at some point anyway. I was coming up to, you know, this year be 40 years in service, I'm turning 61. Uh, it's time to try and make a little money in my life. You know, you do it, you don't get rich being a cop. Yeah. So uh, I was looking to leave at some point, him making this offer to me to help with the COVID recovery in the city, to deal with businesses throughout the city, help get Broadway back, work with the Times Square Alliance, work with all the business improvement districts. It was something different for me to do. It allowed me to get my good friend, Rodney Harrison, give him that opportunity to sit in that seat, let him get those late night phone calls for a while. Uh, was it a great year to go out on? No, you miss you know, all the good things about being the chief of the department, but all you're dealing with is basically the issues of COVID, no more meetings in person, um, all the protests and everything else we had to deal with, but it was time. You know, everyone says they know when it's time. I'm comfortable with the decision. Uh, and it was a great position for me to go into. Well, let's end on a lighthearted note. Uh, yeah. segment called, it's a segment called Rapid Fire. It's five hit and run questions for me, five answers for you. Are you ready? Sure. All right, first, you were a boss for a long time, yeah. But back before that, favorite boss you ever had? Oh, without a doubt, Pete Dunn. Pete Dunn was my sergeant in narcotics. Uh, emulate him. He was side by side with us every day. When we took those 86 guns in 1986, Pete was with us every minute of the way. One of the funniest guys, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. I would do anything for Pete Dunn. Uh, he's probably the boss I try to model myself after the most. Second, top five favorite Rangers of all time. <laughs> Brad Park. Uh, without that, Jean Rattel, I'm dating myself a little bit. Mark Messier, even though it was a short one. Yep. Um, Roger Bear, again, I'm dating myself. And now I'm going to go with. Chris Kreider. I like Chris. I do too. I like the way he's playing this year. I, I think uh, he's going to make a difference. I think this we're going to be a playoff team this year, finally again. Yeah. No, I, I, I love what I'm seeing. Shesterkin and Fox, you know, we haven't yeah. seen a defenseman like Fox since Brian Leach. You You're know, right. and it's it's amazing. And, and the, the Rangers, you know, one of the things, they have just an embarrassment of riches and goaltending. Because think about it. We went from Mike Richter, who I've had on this show, to Henrik Lundqvist. To now Igor. So right. goaltending has never been a problem with the Rangers. Yeah, yeah. Mike Richter won it. I yeah. love Henry, but he never won it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Never Henry. Won it. Yes, that's the sad part about it for me, too. Third, even tougher question top five favorite Yankees of all time. <laughs> Don Mattingly, number one. Okay. Without a doubt. Derek Jeter, Chris Chambliss, um, Thurman Munson, and Ron Guidry. There you go, Louisiana Gator. Love it. Fourth, favorite bar or restaurant in New York City? All right. I'm going to have to go with two in the Bronx. Because if I said just one, they would get mad at me. <laughs> you got Patty's on the Bay in the Bronx, and you got Brewski's in the Bronx. Two of the greatest bars. Uh, you know, I still go back there all the time. A lot of my old friends from the neighborhood are still there. So uh, they got to be my two faves. Fifth and finally, it's still a great job for anybody that wants it. You got a young, you got, we had new cops just come on the job now, 404. If you could be in the room with any one of them, what would you tell them? Don't listen to the noise. Don't listen to the negativity. If you're going to come on this job and you're going to be negative, it's going to be the longest 20 years of your life. Enjoy the opportunities that this job can bring you. Enjoy the moments. Enjoy the friends you're going to meet because you're going to meet some great people. You're going to have friends that you're going to have for the rest of your life. Don't let stuff you read in the paper, you see in the news, get you down. This is still the greatest job. There may be bad moments and there will be bad moments, but there'll be great moments after it. This job always comes back. The negativity that surrounds it, it's all secular. You'll, you will see things come back. You know, I've seen it all through 40 years. I've seen the whole cycle from good to bad to problematic again. Well, when I started this podcast in 2017, my first interview was on the corner of the bed, which is right next to me, uh, over the phone with Mike Francesa. And Mike Francesa kidded me at the time 
saying episode one, I don't think there's going to be an episode two. We're here we are now in episode 126. And the people I've talked to along the way has been incredible. And uh, Chief Monahan, you've been no different before we go. Uh, and, and don't and stick around. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. But before we uh, uh, sign off, uh, is there anything that you want to put out there, uh, promote, shout outs? Listen, just my shout out goes to the men and women of the NYPD. Greatest people I've ever had the honor of working with. This city is only where it is because of what they do each and every day. Uh, to Rodney Harrison, Dermot Shea, and whoever may be the next police commissioner, they will always be there. The men and women, they may complain a lot. They're always, when, when it comes down to getting the job done, no one, no one does it better than the men and women of the NYPD. Thank God for them, and I pray for them every day. My end, of course, you know where to find me on social media. I'll link it in, my, in the description of this podcast. But if you don't, Twitter is Mike in New Haven. And Instagram is original underscore MC1. And LinkedIn, Mike Cologne. Uh, we can catch all my musings, of course, about this podcast and other endeavors that I'm up to. Uh, and I'll put my other contact information on my, as far as my business lines and emails if you want to reach me. Coming up on the Mike the New Haven podcast tomorrow, we like to mix it up on the show, as I like to say often. Jeff Greenfield, legendary journalist. He'll be here. It'll be a live show. Uh, over StreamYard at 3 p.m. live on both YouTube and LinkedIn. So please tune into that one, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Jeff Greenfield. Next week will also be a live show. It's going to be the continuation of the miniseries Tales from the Boom Room Profiles of the NYPD's Bomb Squad, the retired NYPD Bomb Squad Detective Rich Teamsma, who helped defuse uh, both literally and figuratively a terrorist plot in Sunset Park, Brooklyn in 1997, will be with me on the show. Uh, it's the last couple of shows of the year. Uh, as I get ready to go on a December hiatus, but come back at you with more episodes in January of 2022. Like I said, Chief, stick around. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. And on behalf of retired NYPD Chief of Department Terry Monahan, I'm Mike Cologne, and we will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.